Well, good evening. It's good to see this massive crowd here on a Wednesday night. <laughs> uh, hopefully this is not what we are expecting for the new year. <laughs> uh, looking forward to seeing you there online also. Glad to have you with us uh, there on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter. Be sure to heart, to like, to share, to follow, subscribe, retweet us there on uh, Twitter also, and uh, do all those things. That if you comment more than just uh, that you're here, that helps also uh, to get the word out there even more uh, for your friends uh, to know and for it to get the, the uh, video out there before more eyes. Uh, so thank you for being there with us. Also, thank you for being there with us on our phone live streaming. We want to welcome you. If you need that number, uh, you can see me after church, call the church office. We'll be glad to give that to you. If you have access to the website, go to HollandBaptistChurch.com. It's under the info tab that you can download the worship bulletin and the children's worship bulletins. Be sure to uh, take the time to do that. Uh, if you need the worship bulletin, they're in the windowsills and at the doors uh, as you uh, come in uh, and as you leave tonight. And then don't forget under that info tab, especially for you at home, is the prayer list uh, for tonight. So be sure uh, to get that downloaded, uh, at least so you have a digital copy there so you can follow along with the prayer requests uh, as we go through that tonight. We have a few updates to give you uh, on those things. And then also don't forget that you can do your online giving there on our church website. Uh, go to HighlandBaptistChurch.com, go to the far right hand side, click that Give Online tab. Easy platform to set up your regular giving as well as the Lottie Moon Christmas offering giving. Uh, we're getting closer to reaching that goal, so just want to encourage you to keep pressing forward as we're uh, all of that's going to support those missionaries uh, on the field and the ministries that they are doing. So I uh, want to encourage you to take the time to be praying about giving uh, towards uh, supporting those missionaries. Uh, and also don't forget to be praying uh, for them. Uh, so that's all that I have in the way of reminders of things uh, that we have going on. Uh, just in case you're at home and you're one of those in our choir, we do not have choir practice tonight, and we will not have choir practice next Wednesday night either. Uh, so we'll be back for choir practice on January the 10th, uh, as well as Awana will be back uh, then also. So Brother Mike, come and lead us. Take your hymnals and turn to uh, hymn number 61, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. We'll do all four. Thanks, Pat. Savior like a shepherd lead us, much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy foes prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine. We are thine, do thou befriend us, be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sinful, <clears throat> seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, O oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek thy favor, early let us do thy will. 
Blessed Lord and only Savior, with thy love our bodies fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Thank you. Amen. Hopefully at home you've had the opportunity uh, to get your prayer list uh, downloaded there. Um, so hopefully you have that. If you need one of those in person, they're on the front pew uh, on either side uh, of the stage here. All right, so as you take a look at uh, the first part here with our Highland Baptist Church uh, family, uh, let's just go ahead and go down the list here, and we'll see if we have any uh, additions to make uh, to this portion. We have Carolyn and S.W. Stone. Uh, from what I know from Steve, uh, their situation hasn't changed much, so just continue to keep them in your prayers. Uh, remember Vicki Boswell in your prayers. Uh, and stop me anytime you may have an update on any of these. Mike Durham, keep him in your prayers. Brother Arthur Hargrove, uh, keep him in your prayers. Uh, Miss Rosalie Moore, uh, of course, if you remember, she had her birthday back in November and is 101 now, so we praise the Lord for that. From what I understand, she fell a couple of weeks ago, uh, but she is uh, doing so-so uh, from that, so uh, keep her in your prayers. Uh, one that you do have on your list there next is Myra Watson. Uh, we do want to encourage you to remember her. She is in the hospital uh, here in Tullahoma uh, with uh, pneumonia. She also has cancer. Uh, and from what I understand, they've not expected to give her too long uh, to, to live with the cancer. And so we just want to uh, continue to remember her uh, in your prayers. But she does have pneumonia and is here in the hospital. And uh, they had her in the ER earlier today when I saw her. Uh, but we're going to be moving her, to, admitting her to a regular room. So keep her in your prayers, as well as her family. I uh, want to remember Ken Agcock uh, in your prayers, as well as Donna. Uh, keep them in your prayers, about the same situation there. Uh, Miss Betsy Farrell, uh, keep her in your prayers as she continues uh, to heal and continues to have some of her medical issues. She usually is joining us there uh, online also. Uh, remember David Hess, uh, who has cancer, just keep him in your prayers. And Jim, uh, his dad also. Uh, remember George Duncan, uh, uh, who has some medical treatments and some medical issues still. Uh, he's uh, not able to be too far from the house. Uh, so. I uh, want to encourage you to uh, keep him in your prayers. That's one of the reasons he doesn't come. Uh, and the Miss Leona Ross, uh, keep her in your prayers uh, also. She is still up in Michigan uh, and is recovering from some surgeries that she had a few months ago. I uh, want to remember Mark Raymond as he continues to, uh, ha he still has some issues uh, with his back and such, and so we want to, and as well as some other things there with his feet and stuff, so we want to continue to keep him in your prayers. Uh, Miss Sandra Wells, she's doing okay. Uh, but just want to keep her in your prayers with her medical issues and situations. Uh, Miss Jewel Farrell, uh, she is, uh, from what I understand, they still don't know uh, what her uh, situation is, but do keep her in your prayers. She seems to be doing fairly uh, well, but I uh, want to keep her still in your prayers. Bill Warren was here this past Sunday, and so we just praise the Lord for that, that he was able to be here uh, and talk to Miss Faye earlier today, but I know they've been going through a lot with all of their family, so uh, keep them in your prayers, too, with those situations. I've not heard an update on Rick German lately. Uh, I do know he had his surgery at the beginning of December, uh, so keep him in your prayers as he continues to recover. Brother Jack Doubt uh, had some blood work done. From what I understand, he still had not got all of his results back from those things. Uh, Brian Tate said that uh, his uh, doctor visit that he had earlier last week went really well. Uh, he doesn't have to go back, I think he said, for six months is what I believe he told me. Uh, so that was a praise uh, for that. Brother Tony Rogers is doing <laughs> amazingly well. Uh, and uh, just keep him in your prayers as he continues to heal. Uh, Brother Jimmy Marlowe, want to keep him in your prayers as he had had uh, some heart issues. And then uh, Brother Robert Everett uh, will still be in uh, rehab for a while. So we want to keep him in your prayers. Miss Cindy Jordan still had some ongoing medical issues. And then Wade Hall uh, had a, um, they think it was a possible stroke uh, that caused him to lose the vision in his bad eye. Uh, that he has, and uh, so keep him in your prayers. Uh, he is doing well as far as everything, but will not gain, they don't believe we'll ever re regain that sight 
uh, in his eye. So uh, keep him and Suzanne and them in your prayers. Any other family, uh, HBC family side there? Got you know of. All right, we'll go down the, the uh, friends and family side. We have Mike Kauser, uh, who has melanoma. Stop me with any of these. Uh, don't hesitate to say, Preacher, I got an update. Um, and if you're there online, be sure uh, to share us an, an update uh, also. Um, I'll try to get over there to Facebook. Where I can see comments there. Uh, and then also, uh, Katie Jo Bailey. I don't have an update on her, and I don't know anyone that's seen that update more recently on her. Uh, continue to remember Sarah Jernigan, who has some medical issues, as, and uh, that's um, Sherry Jernigan, who used to be one of our teachers with the CDC. That's her sister, uh, who was in a coma. Uh, remember Amanda Harris, who is Mark Smith's niece uh, with breast cancer. Greg Renfro, who's waiting on a kidney transplant. That's the cousin of Bell Royton. Remember Hoyt Farrell. Uh, this is Brother Bobby Farrell's brother. Uh, he is up here now, and he is in um, uh, a facility over in Manchester. Uh, so we just praise the Lord uh, for that. Uh, but just keep him in your prayers as he is there. And then um, Buddy Saunders, who is Charles Saunders' brother, uh, pray for him with his medical issues. And I have talked with Charles, and he said those, that situation is still uh, ongoing. I want to continue to remember the people of Ukraine. Uh, Mamie Thompson, this is Amy Raymond's mother. Uh, who is in her own apartment now, but, and she was in the, nur in the assisted living uh, over at um, Morning Point. Uh, but just keep her in your prayers as she still has some other issues going on. And then Tracy Strobe, who was a request from Bic Vicki Boswell, who's having dialysis. Uh, Ryan Bond with cancer. Rhonda Morris, uh, who still has some pain with her uh, uh, issues that she had from cancer. Uh, and so keep her in your prayer. She's one of our former CDC preschool teachers. Uh, remember the Calgary Mission Project. Uh, Lisa Pitts, uh, who has medical issues. That's Linda Smith's sister. Uh, Herb Taylor, uh, that was a request from Mark Smith, who has cancer. Uh, Melissa Shuren, uh, she's also one of our CDC substitute teachers. Uh, she has some back issues and some other issues that are ongoing too uh, that will be long-term issues. So we, she had asked us if we would put her uh, on the prayer list uh, for prayer. Uh, Tammy Sparkman, who has bone cancer. This is the granddaughter of Leona Ross. Uh, Debbie, Debbie Pancratus and her family. Uh, this was one that Lauren Lee had asked prayer for, uh, who has cancer. Uh, Bill Hargrove, uh, who has medical issues. That's Ann Smith's father. Yvonne Ortiz, uh, who Brian had asked if we would uh, put um, her on the prayer list. Uh, Christine Cranford. Uh, this is Patricia Durham's mom, and I understand the situation uh, doesn't look great there for her mom, so keep her uh, in your prayers. And then uh, I don't, I've not heard any update on Janie Town, who is a sister of Donna Adcock, as well as Terry Parrish. Do we have any update on them? Okay, I've not heard either. So, but do keep them in your prayers. Charles Blevins, uh, Kim Tucker, uh, this is a lady who works in the school system down in Franklin County that Stan Smith had asked us to add, who has cancer. Uh, Wilbur Warren, who is Bill Warren's brother, uh, he still has his ongoing COPD issues. Uh, Charles Miller, uh, who is Matt Kohler's uncle, he still has some of his ongoing issues, although he's had his triple bypass, uh, as well as he, the kidney infection and UTI, so keep him in your prayers. And then Linda Ray, uh, remember her with medical issues, uh, as well as Doug Ray, who was recovering uh, from surgery. He's just a couple of names uh, down below that. Remember Laura Hendricks, this is uh, the daughter of Becky Moffitt. She is still doing her cancer treatments and uh, I think has about two more of those uh, from what I understand to continue with. So keep her uh, in your prayers. And then Sandy McKinney, uh, who Judy Stockdale asked us to add, who has family medical issues. Uh, Andy Taylor, uh, who is Nancy Ritchie's brother, who has cancer. Uh, Ricky uh, Herf Hereford, uh, who has radiation treatment and that's still scheduled for the first, after the first of the year. So keep him in your prayers. And this one was Jimmy had asked us that one. And then the next two are some friends of ours. Uh, when Samantha's had to go to Charlotte for her uh, scans on her aneurysms and stuff, this was a couple we knew we had met from Mount, or met in Mountain City. They are from Charlotte, uh, and they had a cabin there in Mountain City. Would come to church there. Uh, his wife had developed dementia uh, a few years back, 
And so uh, we've been praying for her, but he just recently, just a couple of days ago, found out he has colon cancer and is in the hospital in Charlotte. Um, and he had uh, asked his son, uh, first person he said he wanted to call was to call us to let us know. So um, we wanted to uplift him in prayer. His name is Bill Goff and Kay Goff, uh, both of those, to remember those in prayer. Uh, he's been taking care of her, and it's killing him that he's in the hospital, not able to take care of his wife. Uh, to be there to be a caregiver for her through her situations. Any other friends or family we need to add or any other updates? Yeah, we're friends of ours from First Baptist Church, Colonel Jim Johnson. He passed away at his funeral next week. He's my brother's, actually my brother's wife's dad. And it's Colonel Jim Johnson. So remember, remember the family. They're, he passed away last night, this evening. Okay. So the request there is for Colonel Jim Johnson. He passed away uh, yesterday and just want to remember his family uh, in prayer as they're going through that difficult time and especially here uh, at the holidays. It's hard any time you lose a loved one, but it seems to be especially harder when it's around uh, the holidays. So keep, keep Jim John, Colonel Jim Johnson's family uh, in your prayers. Any others to add to the friends and family side? All right, on the nursing home assisted living list, uh, if you'll remember Mary Campbell, who's at NHC, Peggy Eggleston at Life Care, Susie Barton at NHC, uh, Bertie Davis at Brookdale, uh, Miss Janet Carter, who's at MacArthur Manor, uh, Floyd Prince and Sue Prince, who are at Morning Point, and then Beverly Daniel, who, are, who is at Manchester Rehab. So keep all of those uh, in your prayers. Any others, any other updates before we go to the Lord in prayer? I don't see any on our prayer list there. I mean, on Facebook. So, all right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer uh, for these as well as uh, maybe others that you have. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for who you are and for all the blessings that you have given to us. Lord, we thank you that you are a holy and a righteous and yet a merciful and a loving God. But Lord, we know that your justice must be met for our sin debt, and we know that was met by Jesus upon the cross and we glorify and praise your name for making a way where there seemed to be no way father we come before you tonight because we don't want anything to hinder our prayers so we begin lord acknowledging who you are and your holiness and your righteousness and in in, in looking at ourselves in comparison to you uh, lord we are not good there is none that is good no not one and, and father i pray that as we look at ourselves and see the true reflection of our own sinfulness against your perfect holiness and righteousness, Lord, that we would be convicted of our sins and that we would repent of our sins. Father, I pray tonight that you will cleanse us with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, cast our sins as far as the east is from the west and never to be remembered anymore. Lord, we pray that you would uh, just uh, hear our prayers, especially our prayers on behalf of each one of these uh, that we have on our prayer list, that we've went, went through the names tonight of those we've updated. Maybe there are other requests that we didn't get added to the list tonight that are, uh, that are just now coming to our heart or our mind. Lord, I pray uh, that you would be with each one of those individuals. Father, you know their situations. Uh, you are more than capable and able to take care of each one of these and many, many millions more uh, that are being uplifted in prayer all around this world. And so, Lord, we just want to uplift all of these, asking, Lord, for you to divinely intervene in their lives. We pray, God, that you will uh, bring healing where healing is needed. Uh, Father, if there are other needs that are there, we pray that you'll pour out your grace and your mercy to meet the needs of each one of these people. Lord, we know they're, they're caregivers of each one of these individuals, and sometimes, uh, many times, Lord, they are struggling uh, also as they're seeking to to just continue to love on their loved one and to minister to them and sometimes not even knowing how to do that with those that uh, have dementia and Alzheimer's and all kinds of other uh, mental issues. And so, Father, I pray that uh, you will just give those individuals uh, peace in their hearts to know that you're with them, give them direction, and uh, just to take things one day at a time, one moment at a time, uh, seeking to bring glory and honor to you and, and then to do that again the next day and the next day. Father, I pray that you'll uh, give them the strength to keep pressing forward 
uh, not looking uh, back to the past, Lord, but uh, knowing that you are with them right now in this moment and that you are working about bringing about good for them and their loved ones, and you're working about bringing glory to your name, even through the most difficult of situations that people are going through. Lord, we want to pray for those uh, who especially may be on this list or maybe others who are on our hearts who don't know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. Lord, I pray that the things of, of the holidays here that we've been celebrating and sharing with others, uh, whether that was through the Christmas parade of sharing the, the gospel tracks there or whether it was through uh, the, the Christmas tree uh, that was set up at the South Jackson Center, Lord, or maybe it was the Christmas program itself or maybe some message or sermon that people joined online to see or hear or, or maybe it was the Christmas cantata that, that touched people's hearts Lord, I pray that those seeds that have been planted in people's hearts would stir them, Lord, to uh, come to the realization of their need for Jesus as their Savior. Father, I pray that you will continue to water those seeds that have been planted in, in many thousands of people's lives, especially uh, over these last few months. Uh, Father, I pray that you will just continue to help us to grow uh, your kingdom through Highland Baptist here. And Father, we just pray for your hand to be upon us in a special way, Lord, to use us in whatever way that you would, to minister to the people uh, who are on this prayer list, to encourage them, to walk alongside them, uh, or whether it's other individuals, Lord, that we know that you would use all of those things, and especially here at this time of year, to stir their hearts to faith in Christ. And Lord, for those who, who do know Christ, Christ already, I pray that you would lay a burden that they could not bear upon their hearts uh, to share the good news of the gospel with somebody, some way, somehow, uh, as, especially as we come to the end of this year, before this year ends, and then beginning a new year, making that commitment, Lord, to be faithful to share the good news of the gospel. And I pray, God, that we'll go forth into this new year uh, doing all that you would have us to do, bringing glory to your name, making the name of Jesus uh, known to the people around us. Uh, Father, we thank you for our missionaries who have answered the call to go and to serve. And Lord, I pray that you would burden our hearts also about giving uh, to support those missionaries so that they can stay on the field and continue uh, to, to minister through the, the various ministries uh, that they are doing and, and sharing with people there the good news. Father, I pray that you would have your hand upon all of our international missionaries, especially as we emphasize them during this time of year. Uh, Father, I pray that you will just place a hedge of protection about each one. Uh, Lord, that you will uh, burden, the, burden them, Lord. Uh, with uh, that continued call upon their lives to keep pressing forward when things even get difficult where they are to remain steadfast in their faith with you. And Father, I just pray that you will call new laborers into the harvest, whether that's on the mission field or whether that's here in our local church. Father, I pray that you will send more laborers into the harvest. Lord, we pray for our youth who are meeting with us uh, tonight also in another part of our building. We pray, God, that you would just uh, stir their hearts, Lord, to have a passion uh, for Jesus in, in their lives, Lord, to study your word, to know you more fully, and, and that as they know you more fully and the Holy Spirit dwells within them, Lord, that you would just use them as a radiant light of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ in their school, uh, maybe at their workplace, if they're working in their homes, Lord, I pray, God, that you would use them to share the good news of the gospel and be with our Awana kids uh, and their families as we're apart from them for the Christmas and New Year's uh, holiday here, Lord, I pray that uh, you will help them not to forget the things that have been instilled within them over these last few months of, of Awana uh, with the scriptures that have been hidden in their hearts. Father, that you would recall those things to their heart and mind to, to uh, be faithful, Lord, to uh, follow you and to let your word uh, transform and change their heart and change their mind. And Father, I pray that you'll guard them and protect them. Keep them all, Lord, uh, in good health uh, during this time uh, that they're apart from us. Lord, And we pray that you will just continue to be with us, especially tonight as we come once again uh, to the book of Zechariah. May, may you make your word powerful, alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. Help us to understand it. Uh, not only to understand the knowledge uh, and the wisdom of the, of the verses themselves, but how we might apply it to our lives. 
And so, Father, I pray that you would use it to encourage us, uh, especially as we come uh, to the close of this new year, uh, and even as we know that we're coming closer and closer to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, to reign upon this earth as the King of kings and Lord of lords. So, Father, we pray that your word will come forth tonight uh, and not return void, and we pray, God, that you will use it to change our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen and amen. Take your Bibles, if you will, then, and turn to Zechariah chapter 10. Uh, we're getting closer to the book, end of the book of Zechariah, uh, and at the end of the Old Testament here, especially as we're looking at these minor prophets. This is uh, the next to the last of the minor prophets that we have uh, come to examine and to look at and to see how do this, does this word apply to us. As we've been looking at Zechariah, uh, we've seen that uh, he has been, Zechariah has been sharing uh, through God the, the message here of the coming of the Messiah, uh, that even though uh, the enemy has oppressed them and even gone farther than what God intended for them to do in hurting uh, his people, uh, God is exacting his judgment on Israel's enemies in chapter 9. Uh, he talks about the coming of the King of Zion, which is Jesus Christ. Not only his first coming, but ultimately in those last verses there uh, of chapter 9, he's talking about the return of Jesus Christ the second time, his second coming. And, and so we continue with that same emphasis as we come into chapter 10. So let's read verse 1 and verse 2 of chapter 10 first, and then we will uh, get into the rest of the verses here uh, in just a moment. So he says in beginning in verse 1, Ask rain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain from the Lord who makes the storm clouds, and he will give them showers of rain to everyone the vegetation in the field. For the household gods utter nonsense, and the diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give empty consolation. Therefore the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for lack of a shepherd. And so seeing that at the beginning of this message uh, in these verses, I entitled my message tonight, The Faithful Shepherd. Uh, and, and you're going to see how that applies all the way throughout uh, this and that picture that God gives us, and even Jesus himself in the New Testament gives us of the faithful shepherd. Uh, when I was a youth minister, one of the things that we did sometimes as kind of an object lesson, a game uh, with the kids that we had them do from time to time was to have all the students to hold hands and, and to form a circle. And, and then we'd tell them, you know, no matter what, don't let go of each other's hands uh, and follow me. And so I would take and, and hold the hands of two students on the side of me as they're holding hands all the way around the circle. And I would begin to move across the circle and would step over somebody's arms and come around and let those two people follow me through. And we'd do that again through a different person till we're making this circle of a, a big tied knot here. And so You'd step over and over, different pairs. They're struggling to keep up with their hands uh, together. It, it took less than a minute to get the whole group uh, tangled up in one big mess. Uh, and then I'd release the hands of the two students I was holding and put their hands together uh, and step out and, and, and say to them, now without letting go of each other's hands, make a circle again. And at least for the next four or five minutes, sometimes 10 or 15 minutes, uh, they, they work together, retracing their steps, uh, telling each other, go under us, step over our hands here, step over our hands there, uh, do this, do that, until they successfully made their way back to form a circle. You know, the purpose of that exercise was mainly to teach the students the value of teamwork. Uh, but there were some other lessons that were to be learned also that I think apply here to what we're going to see in these verses. One of the other lessons that you learned in that game is, is that it's a lot easier to get tangled than it is to get untangled. Another thing we learned is, is that the person who gets you into the tangled mess leaves you to untangle things by yourself. <laughs> and you see that happen uh, in life so often. And, and then thirdly, the biggest lesson of all was this, where and how you wind up 
depends on who you follow. That was one of the biggest lessons you learned through that little game, object lesson, if you will. When the Scripture talks about who we're following, where we're going, and how they are leading us, the Bible often uses the very common image of sheep and a shepherd. And the first shepherd we meet in the Bible is also the first man who dies in the Bible because of his faith in God. His name, we remember, was Abel, the second son born to Adam and Eve. Genesis 4 and verse 4 says this, And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regarded for Abel and his offering. So he had a flock. He was a shepherd himself. After that, in the Old Testament, we read about Abraham, the father of faith. Uh, he was a shepherd. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 16 says, And for her sake he dealt, with, dealt well with Abram, and, and he had sheep and oxen and male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. So he had sheep also. Uh, so he was a, a shepherd of sorts. His grandson... Jacob had a whole episode that, that evolves and comes about by him being a shepherd. In fact, uh, his name later becomes Israel. Uh, he was also a shepherd. Genesis 30, verse 31 says, He said, What shall I give you? Jacob said, You shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. And so you can go back and read in Genesis chapter 30 and the chapters before that and right after that of, of Jacob being a shepherd. Uh, you read about Moses in the Old Testament, the, who's the great lawgiver. Uh, he was rescued from a basket by Pharaoh's daughter, raised, and, raised up in Pharaoh's household as, as a ruler there. He was also, though, a leader of Israel. And we find in the Scripture that he worked for a season as a shepherd himself. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So before he comes to the burning bush, uh, he's out leading his sheep uh, through the pastures, through the wilderness, and comes to the mountainside. So there's Moses who was a shepherd. You read about David. The great King David. David uh, shepherded the sheep in the field before he became a king and before he became shepherd over all of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 18 and verse 19 said that one of the young men answered and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. This is speaking to King Saul uh, when he couldn't get his spirit calmed and everything. And, and this man said, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David your son who is with the sheep. He's a shepherd. One of the best psalms that many of us remember is Psalm 23 and verse 1. Uh, can you quote that without looking at the screen there with me? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And so we find out that the Lord himself is to be uh, our shepherd. It's no surprise then that we find out about Jesus, that Jesus himself describes himself as the good shepherd. In John chapter 10 and verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So you see that imagery all the way back in the beginning of Genesis, all the way through to the life of, of Jesus himself. And throughout the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the best known passages uh, of Scripture uh, that use the image of the shepherd are many times using that imagery of the shepherd in a positive way. But there are some places, a few places uh, in the Scriptures where the Bible talks about shepherds from a negative context, especially in the prophets. There were men like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and others who, who criticized some of the shepherds of Israel. Now, who were they criticizing? They weren't criticizing the guys like we see on our, our manger scene here that are shepherds who are out watching the fields and the flocks there. He's talking about the religious leaders 
who are to be watching over the flock of Israel, who are to be leading the people of Israel to a faithful walk with God. And so these were ungodly leaders that he's talking about, uh, wicked kings, corrupt priests, and even other prophets, because they were leading God's people in the wrong direction. And so sometimes the shepherd uh, terminology is used in a negative way uh, to speak of, of those ungodly leaders. Well, Zechariah chapter 10 and chapter 11, so we're going to see chapter 11 next week, warns against following the wrong kind of shepherd. Now, that's what we're going to see mostly next week in chapter 11 is the wrong kinds of shepherd. But Zechariah starts here to lay out for us what does the right kind of shepherd look like? What does the good shepherd look like? And so we're going to notice here in chapter 10 and verse 3, uh, this, is, this verse is pivotal in these chapters. Notice that the shepherds are equated with leaders. Uh, look at verse 3 again. He says, My anger is hot against the shepherds. And he says, to make sure we understand who the shepherds are, he says, And I will punish the leaders. Those are who the shepherds are that he's talking about. For the Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his majestic steed in battle. So God is angry with these leaders. He promises to punish them because he says, I care for my flock. I care for the people of Judah. And you as the religious leaders are to be representing me. And if you're not representing me by taking care of my people, you're being like an unworthy, an ungodly shepherd. And so where God's people winded up depended on the type of leader or the type of shepherd that they followed. And so Zechariah 10 through 11 are going to give us four pieces of evidence to prove this truth. The very first one is found there in verse 1 down to verse 12. In, this, in fact, this entire chapter is the work of the faithful shepherd. And so verse 1 of this chapter, as we've already read there, is kind of a transition that bridges the promise of, of health and the welfare of God's people at the end of chapter 9 with the rest uh, of the book. And so when Zechariah says to ask the Lord for rain in verse 1, uh, then, then that could be seen as a rebuke to those in Judah who were looking to the false gods, who were looking to Baal to provide favorable weather uh, for the land. And so after reminding the people that it's the Lord who makes the rain clouds, that's what he goes on to say, uh, he says, ask rain from the Lord. Don't go to these false gods. Don't go to these false idols that you've been going to all this time. Ask rain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain, from the Lord who makes the clouds, and he will give them showers of rain to everyone, the vegetation uh, in the field. Uh, and so uh, here we see that uh, he's talking about the, the Lord makes the rain clouds. It's the Lord who provides the showers of rain and crops in the field for everyone. And so then Zechariah begins to contrast the work of the Messiah as Israel's faithful shepherd with the misleading work of the false shepherds who follow idols. So verse 2 says, For the household gods, they utter nonsense. Uh, the diviners, they, they see lies. They tell false dreams. They give empty consolation. In other words, they're telling you the, the farthest thing from what my word tells you. In fact, the word we get here in, in the English Standard Version is that they're, they're telling false dreams. Uh, that's the Hebrew word hawan, which means vain or worthless uh, assurances and, and comfort that is empty, that is meaningless. So it's like uh, somebody's going through suffering, somebody's going through pain, uh, and you're off trying to offer them comfort, uh, and, and your words are just empty. It's meaningless. It does no good for, for those individuals. And that's what he's saying that these, these false uh, prophets are doing. Uh, they're, they're offering, these diviners are doing. They're giving false dreams that don't bring any consolation. It's empty consolation. And, and so he says that the idols themselves are speechless and powerless. Now, Jeremiah had said in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 5 ab about their idols, he said their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field and they cannot speak. What a picture. 
to give there. <laughs> of a scarecrow out in a cucumber field, and he says, the scarecrow can't do anything. You ever seen a scarecrow talk? Maybe on the Wizard of Oz, and that's about it, and that's make-believe there. You never see a scarecrow talk out there to, to scare the crows away, to scare the enemy away. He says, their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field, and they cannot speak. And he's saying that's like these diviners, these soothsayers who are serving these idols by seeking omens and signs, and, and they speak lies on their behalf. It's as if uh, they're, they're speechless themselves. They're deceiving Israel, the very people that they were entrusted to care for and to guide. Understand this, that we as a church have an awesome, huge responsibility for those who are already of the faith. I mean, think about it. Those of you who are here tonight, those of you who are watching online, how long have you been a Christian? I dare say most of us have been a Christian for a long time. Are we investing into the next generation to make sure that they understand the truths of God's Word? Or are we telling them empty things? Or are we telling them nothing at all, like a scarecrow in a cucumber field that can't even speak? They're relating these empty dreams. They're relating empty comfort. And as a result, the people are being led astray, left to wander like sheep, and to suffer affliction, experiencing catastrophe after catastrophe because there's no faithful shepherd for them to follow. One of the greatest responsibilities we have is to disciple believers. Those who have been entrusted with much are, are to be entrusting others with the things that we have learned, the things that we have come to understand from God's Word. Uh, we have an awesome responsibility to make sure we're teaching the next generation. That's one of the reasons we put so much emphasis on our youth and our children's programs, to make sure that we're instilling the truths of God's Word into their little hearts and their little minds. You know, once they get up to be adults, it's harder then to, to change their thinking and to help them to come to a place of openness it, beyond uh, the Holy Spirit working in their hearts to bring that about. But they don't have that seed already planted. So the more that we can reach young people, the more we can reach uh, children and youth uh, and share the gospel with them and share the truths of God's Word, the more they have that Word hidden in their hearts that God can use that as seed in their hearts to come to faith in Christ. Uh, he can use that for those who have come to faith in Christ to grow grow in their walk, to, to be disciple, to become uh, faithful follower, faithful leaders uh, of the future. And, and, and so others will follow them faithfully as they emulate Christ in their lives. So as we come down to verse 3, uh, following his declaration of anger at these false shepherds, notice what he says in verse 3. He says, My anger is hot against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders, for the Lord of, Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his majestic steed in battle. And so he identifies these as leaders. Literally, the term there is translated in many other places as he goats, which was a derogatory term. It's the Hebrew word hatud which the Lord expresses, then expresses his commitment to tend his flock. He says, I'm not going to do like those hatud. I'm not going to do like those he goats. I'm going to take care of my flock. I'm going to make them uh, like my majestic horse in battle. And you may wonder, why does he switch here uh, from the imagery of sheep and shepherds to that of the horse? Well, the shift from sheep imagery to horse imagery may seem in, inconsistent to us, uh, but the, the, the thing that is constant through both imageries is the Lord's care. So whether he's a shepherd or, or whether he's a warrior who gives attention to his horse, the Lord gives attention and care to the house of Judah, just like he gives care and attention to you and to me. He is faithful. He loves you. He cares for you. So when you're going through things in this life and you think nobody cares, Know that God cares, and God loves you in a great and mighty way. So in the following verses, the Lord promises to provide personal care, to provide personal leadership for his people through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So verse 4 says, here again is that imagery he begins to focus when he says him, from him. He's talking about here uh, the Messiah. He says, from him shall come the cornerstone 
from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler, all of them together. So what do you see repeated over and over in that one verse? What's the phrase you see? From him. From him shall come the cornerstone, from him uh, the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler. When the Bible repeats something over and over, we said this multiple times before, is something you need to pay attention to. Uh, and, and there's an emphasis here uh, that we want to see is that the focus is on the, the Lord, the Messiah. He's the cornerstone. He's the tent peg. He's the battle boat. Now, the cornerstone uh, was a block that would be placed at the intersection of two walls uh, in a building to establish here's the proper location, here's the correct orientation of this house, of this whole building. If the cornerstone is not in the right place, then the whole building can be out of line. I mean, I know I built our little church that go in on our float, and we put it together, and I said, Jimmy, I'm not a carpenter, so I'm not sure everything's going to match up, and, and it didn't all match up exactly on that roof. We hit a lot of imperfections uh, on that roof uh, that we had on our parade float. You know, when you have the correct cornerstone in the building, it is perfect, it's true, uh, where the two walls meet together. It gives that correct orientation to the whole building. And so as the cornerstone... The Messiah is faithful and reliable. How do we know that? We'll look at another scripture in the Bible. Psalm 118, verse 22. Very famously uses the same image to describe the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and his rejection by men, but his validation by God. Here's what it says. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So they rejected Jesus Christ the first time he came as the Messiah, but God says, I made him the cornerstone. They rejected him, and they didn't like him as the stone, but he is the cornerstone himself. And so he is the one who is faithful. He is the one who is reliable. So he is the cornerstone. But then he says he is the, the, the tent peg. Uh, and, and the tent peg can be seen as a double image, uh, referring to both a peg and a wall that could support frequently used items in the house, like Isaiah says in Isaiah 22, verse 23 and 24. He says, I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place, and he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. And they will hang on him. So in other words, he hung this uh, peg in a certain place on a wall. And I, it, it, they will hang on him the whole honor of his father's house, the offspring and issue, every small vessel from the cups to all the flagons. So it, it's, it has a double image there that it's like a, a peg in a wall that supports frequently used items or pegs in the ground that secure a tent or, or support it so that it can accommodate a, a large family like in Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 2 and verse 3 that says, Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitation be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left and your offspring will possess the nations and will people uh, the desolate cities. In either case, in either case here, a tent peg is speaking here of creating stability for a home. And God says the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is going to create stability for my house, for my people. And then he gives this other image of a battle bow. The battle bow describes the Lord's fearlessness, his conquering power. And as a result of the Messiah's strength and stability, verse 5 promises that he will cause his people to fight like warriors in battle. So he gives those imageries there in verse 4. Verse 5 says, They shall be like mighty men in battle, trampling the foe or the enemy in the mud of the streets. They shall fight because the Lord is with them, and they shall put to shame the riders on horses. In other words, they don't have horses. They don't have, uh, he's saying, uh, all the resources that the other nations might have. Uh, but he's saying here uh, that I'm going to use my people to put horsemen 
to shame and triumph over their enemies. And then we come down to verse 6 through the end of the chapter in verse 12, and he describes what is God going to do? What am I going to do in Israel under the faithful leadership of the Messiah? So in these verses, in these uh, verse 6 down through verse 12, there are 21 uh, predictive statements in these verses. Several of these uh, which focus on the Lord's personal actions on behalf of the people. Uh, for example, the declaration, I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph. In fact, that's what he goes on to say uh, in verse 6. That not only assures God's power uh, to his people, but it also emphasizes I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to unite the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel represented by the house of Joseph. And so he says in verse 6, I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph, speaking of northern and southern kingdoms. I will bring them back because I have compassion on them and they shall be as though I had not rejected them for I am the Lord their God and I will answer them. So when he says I'll bring them back, that means to restore them. Well, what they're needing is a spiritual revival. They are needing a restoration spiritually. He says, because I have compassion on them. <coughs> and so he's emphasizing here his care and his provision for his flock. Who does he say will answer them? Not these worthless gods over here and these other idols and these false prophets. He says, I will answer them. So when he says, I will answer them, he's speaking to say, I will be near to my people. Uh, I will be responsive to their needs. And all of that is going to result in their strength in the battle and their renewed joy, as verse 7 goes on to say. He says, Then Ephraim shall become like a mighty warrior, and their hearts shall be glad as with wine. Their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. Who shall see it? Their children. Did you know little eyes are watching you all the time? If you're here as a believer, you're at home there as a believer, little eyes are watching you all the time. Your children, your children's children, your family's children, they're watching you. They hear you say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. But do they see that in your life? Do they see that in your actions? Do they hear that in your words and the way you speak to others and the things you do to others? Or do they see something else? He says here, when these are strengthened by the hand of God, when they are restored by God himself, he says, then they will become like a mighty warrior. Then their hearts will be glad and their children shall see it. And their children shall will be glad, and their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. What a picture and an image there. Now, this is a, a very prominent shepherd imagery that we go to now in verse 8, that he says, I will whistle for them. <whistles> you ever do that? Whistle for an animal to come? Whistle for a dog to come? Whistle for a, a pet to come? Well, here's the, the emphasis here. It comes from the shepherd. He says, I will whistle for them and gather them in, for I have redeemed them, and they shall be as many as they were before. So he says, I'm going to whistle for them. I'm going to gather them. Now, the whistle was a sharp, clear signal that shepherds, I can't do that, where you stick your fingers and your, lip, and your lips there and make that real loud whistle. I can't do that. But there are individuals who can do that. Shepherds could make a clear, uh, sharp signal uh, you, uh, that they would use in calling the sheep. And what he's saying, though, here is that even though God's people are scattered in distant places, when I call them, they're going to return. And he says in verse 9, Though I scattered them among the nations, yet in far countries they shall remember me, and with their children they shall live and return. So what he's talking about here is not just about what is happening in the days just ahead of Zechariah. He's talking about ultimately about the last days. 
He's talking about there's going to be a day when, when all my people are going to be scattered uh, all over this world in many different places. But one day I'm going to call my people and they are going to return. In fact, when you read the book of Revelation, when you read Ezekiel, when you read Daniel, you read the, prof the prophetical books of the last days, you see that over and over and over of God's people coming back to the Holy Land, coming back to the Promised Land. And then verse 10 uses language that probably was taken from Hosea. Hosea chapter 8 verse 13 uses a similar language, but let's read verse 10 first. He says, I will bring them home from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. And I will bring them to the land of Gilead and to Lebanon till there is no room for them. In other words, till the whole land is packed full of my children. Uh, Hosea chapter 8 verse 13 says this, As for my sacrificial offerings, they sacrifice me to eat it, but the Lord does not accept them. For he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. So that was a punishment on them. They're going to go back to Egypt. But what happened in Egypt? Old Testament, early Old Testament, they were there uh, in captivity for 400 years there uh, in, in Egypt. Uh, and so then you see God delivering them out of Egypt. But they had gone to Egypt. He says uh, because of their sins, they're going to return to Egypt. They're going to go back to the bondage that they were in before. They thought when they came out of that and they were in the wilderness that, oh, I wish, Moses, we wish you'd just left us there in Egypt. They always wanted to go back to Egypt. Well, even when they were in the promised land and they began to turn their backs on God, they began to make alliances with Assyria in the north, alliances with Egypt in the south, and they forget about God. And so God says, okay, have at it. You want Egypt? Go on down to Egypt. You're not going to stay here. You're going back to Egypt. And so he sent some of them back to Egypt, some of them up to Assyria. Hosea chapter 11, verse 5 uh, speaks of the exile to Assyria. Uh, it says, They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king. Because, why? They have refused to return to me. So understand, when we refuse to listen to the Lord God, we, we saw that imagery a couple of chapters back of sticking the fingers in the air, and I'm not going to listen to you, God. I don't want to hear what you have to say. When you refuse to listen to God and you refuse to return to Him, He says, okay, I'm, I'm going to remove my protection over you and my blessings over you. And, and, and so He's saying here, you're going to go back to, to bondage like you were in Egypt. You're going to go to bondage in Assyria. So not only do God's promises mention the places from which the Lord is going to deliver His people, but also the places to which He's going to bring them. He says, I'm going to bring them to the land of Gilead, and to Lebanon. So even in the promised land, the people would be so numerous that there's not going to be enough room for them all. And, and so after judging and disarming uh, the powers that had captured his people and after overcoming any obstacle that would have hindered uh, them from returning, verse 11 says, he shall pass through the sea of trouble. What is that reminiscent of? Passing through the Red Sea. So he says, I'm going to deliver them from Egypt, and it's going to be like when they came through the Red Sea. I'm going to deliver them through the Sea of Troubles and strike down the waves of the sea, and all the depths of the Nile shall be dried up. The pride of Assyria shall be laid low, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. So just like a shepherd can whistle or play a tune on a pipe and call his flock together, so the Lord is going to gather his people, and it'll be like a second exodus when they pass through the Sea of Trouble. Or affliction to return to the Lord and to their land. Verse 12, I will make them strong in the Lord, and they shall walk in his name, declares the Lord. So Zechariah 10 is underscoring the truth that the work of the Messiah, the faith, God's faithful shepherd, is to deliver is to strengthen, is to save, is to care for his people. And so his faithfulness was demonstrated in bringing back Judah from the exile, but it's significant that this passage, written after the exile, is clearly oriented still towards the future. James Montgomery Boyce said this. He said this passage refers to a future regathering, not just the regathering of the people from Babylon following the exile. That was already history at the time of the writing of this chapter. He says the prophecy must concern a yet future day. The regathering may have begun with the reestablishing 
of the modern state of Israel. This will be a great regathering, he says, though, in which the scattered flock of the Messiah is returned to its own land and to great material and spiritual blessing. What a day of victory that will be. God's people, Israel, are going to be regathered, redeemed, reunited as one nation, rejoicing in the strength of the Lord. What a day that will be. But that same God can give that same blessing to his church today. We are a scattered people, divided and sometimes distant even from each other. But the Lord can unite us in Christ and bring us together. You know, we're fighting battles uh, against the enemy, but the Lord can strengthen us. The Lord can turn his helpless sheep into victorious war, horse, war horses. How much he is willing to do for us. If only we would admit our failures, admit our unbelief, and turn to him for help. That reminds me of this old song. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrows there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. But forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. When we follow the faithful shepherd, he and he alone will lead us safely home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending us the faithful shepherd, Jesus Christ. And the work is not finished yet, Lord. The work is not finished until the trumpet sounds and Jesus returns again to set up his kingdom here upon this earth until we draw our last dying breath. Lord, help us to hear the call of the shepherd, the great shepherd on our lives. First, the call to salvation, to become his sheep, to become his child of God by trusting in Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. And then to hear his call daily, uh, following the shepherd as he leads us uh, down the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, helping us not to make uh, wrong decisions, to not turn to the right or to the left, but to keep on following his word, his will, his way. Father, I pray tonight that we would follow the shepherd each and every step of each and every day, Lord, that one day, what a glorious day that will be when our Jesus we will see. The one who took us by the hand and led us through the promised land. Lord, may we follow you each and every day, the faithful shepherd. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, thank you so much for joining with us there, especially online. Uh, come back and join us Sunday in person if you can. Uh, we will be having regular service uh, this coming Sunday morning. Uh, we'll have regular Sunday school, regular church on Sunday morning. Sunday night, we will not have service uh, because we have New Year's Day the next day, so we won't have uh, service Sunday night. But come and join us uh, for Sunday morning. Uh, come for Sunday school at 915, worship at 1030. Uh, you can join us there online if you can't join us in person. We know a lot of people are sick with different things at this time of year. So uh, you take care of yourself, get better, uh, keep trusting the Lord, keep following Him. But you have a blessed week, a safe week. We'll see you this coming Sunday. Thank you.